I've said this before, but it remains especially relevant today that the two main ways Donald Trump evades justice, accountability, responsibility, and all of that is by one, almost putting nothing down on writing and two, demanding and commanding that everyone around him, whether it was in the political or business world, have a code of silence and loyalty that whenever Donald Trump is doing something shady or embarrassing or potentially criminal or all of the above, of, those people are expected to say absolutely nothing. But that wall of silence, especially in the last few weeks, has been shattering and crumbling and dissolving. And many people are starting to speak up about all the evil that Donald Trump did, or at the very least tried to do. And a lot of those folks are especially important because again, not a lot of this is being written down and many folks are still loyal to Trump. So whenever you get someone that was in the room, like a Cassidy Hutchinson, it's a big deal. And that's exactly what happened today in a massive blockbuster for the first time interview. One of the people designated to guard Donald Trump, in particular on J6, one of the people guarding that man's body, stepped forward and brought absolute corroboration of Donald Trump's anger on that day, corroborating Hutchinson's testimony. And this is incredible. I'm going to play you the whole clip. I want you to listen to the entire thing because one, it's entertaining and two, it shows that the people sworn to protect Donald Trump's life knew that on that day, things could have been so much worse and they themselves were terrified. Tell us more about how you learned that then president was adamant about adamant about going to the Capitol. Well, I mean, it's constant. The communication comes directly from the uh, Secret Service agent and to the lead officer in the car. So you're constantly, you know, concerned about the movements, you know, of the president. So you need to know, and that communication is coming directly from the, um, the agent. Mm -hmm. What did you, what did, what was conveyed to you? How insistent, just how insistent was he about going? Well, I mean, we've heard it several times while I was on the motorcade. Uh, I think during the speech, shortly thereafter, he had finished the speech that the president was getting into the motorcade and he was upset and he, you know, adamantly wanted to go to the Capitol. And even when we departed from the ellipse, it was repeated again that the president, it was a heated argument in the limo and he wanted to definitely go to the Capitol. So when we arrived at the White House, uh, the, the motorcade was placed on standby. Mm -hmm. So how did that, as, as, as we say in the vernacular now, how did that hit with you guys on that day? I mean, for me, I really didn't know what was, you know, what, what was actually happening outside the ellipse. I could hear, you know, transmissions from the radio that, you know, large crowds were going up to the Capitol, but I didn't know exactly what was happening. So for me, you know, to, to know that there are armed subjects outside, to know that there are large crowds responding, that was alarming because, one, we weren't prepared to do that. Normally, when you move a presidential motorcade, you have a secure route. So we didn't have sufficient personnel to do that. So we weren't comfortable with, with that move. Yeah, were you saying, what on earth does he want to go back to the Capitol? Was that what you guys were, were thinking? I mean, I, absolutely. I mean, now knowing what, what actually happened, that would have been horrible. You know, had, you know, the motorcade responded, you know, to the Capitol, I think it would have been just far worse. Uh, uh, it's pretty bad. <laughs> you think that, what, far worse, how so? You mean lives possibly? Meaning that, I mean, I think it, it would have, uh, you know, probably encouraged uh, more riding, you know, and I felt supported, you know, if the presidential motorcade came in support of them. So I think the insurrectionists probably would have felt as though they had the support of the president. Mm -hmm. What did you say? You said that you had been in over 100 motorcades with Trump before, but never heard anything like that ever. Well, it's not necessarily 100 um, motorcades with President Trump. So I've been in the, in the motorcade since 2011. You just so mean in general? Several, in right, general, right. over 100. So, um, I'm sorry, what was your question, Don? Yeah, I said you had been in one, okay, one, oh, over yes. 100 motorcades and nothing like that had ever happened. Right, so, I, I mean, when a president is moving, you know, in my experience, if a president is going to a destination, we go. And there are some, some moves that just pop up along the way. And, but it's always communicated, it's always worked out, and we go. I've never experienced, the mo you know, when the president wants to go somewhere and there's a heated argument and dispute and a debate of whether or not the president can go somewhere. 
and then we actually don't go. I've never had that experience before. I don't have too much more to add, guys, but this is what we need to see. We need to see all of the people near Trump on those days and every day coming forward to speak the truth. They need to do it. His staffers, his bodyguards, his cooks, his cleaners, they are the people we need to hear about. They might not be important people, but some of them are sharing the darkest secrets, and there's more dark secrets to come.